Hi, my name is Shafi Golasar. I'm the director of the Simons Institute for Theory of Computing. And last month, um, a group of researchers gathered at the Simons uh, Institute for a workshop, a week-long workshop, on um, a topic called multi-group fairness and the validity of statistical judgment. The workshop organizer uh, was Omer Reingold, who's here with us and as my guest today. And Omel is the Rajiv Matwani Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University. He's the director of the Simons Collaboration for the Theory of Algorithmic Fairness. So Omer, thank you very much for joining us uh, for, an for an episode of Polylogs. Um, do you want to say a word to introduce yourself before we launch in? Um, I'm a, um, a theoretician. I've been for in my entire career. Uh, so I come from the theory of computer science. Of course, uh, the Simon Institute is uh, currently a focal point of, of exactly this kind of area. And I've been working on various areas, uh, cryptography, complexity theory, uh, but a lot of my research, especially in the last decade are on the societal impact of computation. And I guess that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah, so in fact, within the societal impact of computation, uh, today, and uh, we're talking about algorithmic fairness, the topic of this workshop. And I know that you specifically have been studying algorithmic fairness for quite a while. It's not a recent occupation, but probably about a decade. And uh, I think um, it's fair to say that you and your colleagues have spearheaded the foundations of the field. Uh, can you start by explaining to us all what is algorithmic uh, fairness and how it originated as a field? And then we could segue into the topic of the workshop, which was multi-group fairness and how that fits in. Sure. So yeah, we started to look at it in 2010, which is a while ago. And I think my collaborators had the vision that uh, computations are going to be more and more uh, central in, uh, in making decisions or informing decisions about individuals. And once uh, algorithms are doing that, and uh, then we should uh, be concerned that algorithms uh, treat individuals fairly. Uh, just like when other when humans uh, make decisions, we want to make sure that humans are not discriminating, uh, for example, on, on the basis of various uh, societal groups like uh, and attributes like uh, race, gender, ethnicity, and others. Um, this was 2010, I think it required the vision, uh, which my collaborators uh, provided. But I think today it's absolutely clear that we see algorithms everywhere. We see it in the data that we read, uh, the news articles that we read, uh, and in medical decisions about us. Uh, it takes part in the legal system, medical system, any kind of... Uh, uh, thing that affects our life uh, involves algorithms. And now we really want to ask and make sure that these algorithms are not discriminating against individuals. So that's kind of the major question of uh, algorithmic fairness uh, today. And uh, how does multigroup fairness fit into this larger field? So multigroup fairness is kind of a new approach, something for the last uh, five, six years that tries to address uh, what discrimination could be or what fairness could mean in a more subtle way than was uh, discussed before. Um, the first thing you can uh, start when you're trying to understand what, uh, what kind of discrimination uh, is are these notions of group fairness. You look at the entire group, perhaps defined by one of these uh, protected attributes. And you say, how are people from one group uh, are treated compared to another group on average? So these are kind of an on average uh, groups. For example, we can ask how many individuals from one group uh, are shown advertisements about uh, tech jobs and how many uh, individuals from the other group are shown these uh, ads. How many individuals from one group are accepted to the university and how many from the other group? What's the fraction? And there are various kinds of notions uh, like that. What we kind of understood a while ago, and this was actually the motivation of this uh, 
um, work from uh, 2010 is that these notions are very, very weak. Uh, it's very easy to um, satisfy these definitions on average, while uh, they're still discriminating against particular individuals from this community. Multigroup fairness says that uh, it's not enough to look at individuals as part of one group. Uh, we are a part of many, many groups and perhaps many subtle groups, intersection of groups of care of what is our gender and race and other uh, even more subtle definitions, way of viewing us. And we want it to be the case that we are treated well uh, uh, regardless of uh, which group we come uh, from. And even when we look at the very, very complex set of uh, subgroups that one could care about. And, and somehow uh, we have been seeing that this uh, does give a much better protection against discrimination, a much more uh, subtle protection. So, um... It's interesting that you brought up the question that uh, this gives us uh, guarantees on the average. And then you elaborated that multigroup fairness is stronger because it will give us a guarantee on the average, but based on my on our uh, membership in many groups. So not just gender, but say gender and race and age, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still a, a notion that talks about a guarantee for the average person with multiple attributes. Um, so the intriguing question that comes up, a perhaps somewhat technical question, is what does this average uh, say about individuals? Right, that's, that's a wonderful uh, question. Our first uh, work uh, uh, really looked at what we called at the time individual fairness. And in some sense, you can look at multigroup fairness as a, as a kind of an interesting point between group fairness and individual fairness. And the more and more groups uh, you consider, the closer you get into an idea of individual uh, fairness. Individual fairness is very appealing. I still like it, and I think it's applicable in many cases. But the issue is that it is uh, hard to get uh, real data about individuals. And uh, on the other hand, we can get uh, data on groups. But the thing is that uh, we want to get data on many, many subgroups. So I'll, I'll give you perhaps an example. You, you go to a physician and they tell you um, that your probability of some uh, medical condition in the next 10 years is 4%. Question, what does it mean? I mean, they don't <laughs> know everything about you. They essentially fit your a few attributes about you into a formula. And this formula tells them that people with these few attributes on average have this probability, this 4% for this medical condition. What does it tell you? What does it tell about you? Perhaps from people from your a group, and uh, this is, there is something better to be said or, or more accurate. And, and, and um, in fact, there are many studies, right? And each study could look at some other subgroup. And in this group, perhaps they'll tell you you have 3%, and in this group, you have 2%. The multigroup fairness wants something that would make sense and, and will take into account all the kind of information that could be gathered. Uh, from statistical evidence, and rather than taking into account perhaps a single study or, or more. Um, so going, uh, so we're going to be continuously doing this interview, uh, uh, segueing to more technical and more societal issues. Um, so now going from the technical to more general. Um, traditionally, uh, I guess historically, when people talk, uh, hear the word fairness. People who are not technical necessarily, who haven't followed the literature, they immediately think about marginalized, under, underrepresented groups, and so forth. Uh, I understand that one of the um, uh, appealing aspects of multi group fairness is that rather than stick to something that you have in mind in a priori or something that's mandated by the law, it, it has a more general. Uh, it's a more general definition that can capture a lot more than people that today we think are under 
represented or marginalized. Can you expand on that? Yeah, that, that's a great uh, point. Um, there are various reasons for which group fairness uh, is problematic. One reason is perhaps the one I hinted before is that even if we know what the group is, we can still uh, uh, discriminate against the, the group while being okay on average. But the point that you're raising is that we actually don't necessarily know how to define the groups we want to protect. And it's, it's known that even uh, members of groups that are discriminated against, are oppressed, don't always know that, uh, that, that uh, to, to say that they are being discriminated against and that they are a group that should be viewed in real time. And definitely society who is doing the discrimination doesn't always uh, in real time uh, realizes that. Furthermore, even if we know uh, which group specific group uh, we want to protect, there are many, many ways of uh, defining membership in this group. So I'll take an example that's closer to me, which is uh, Judaism. Uh, defining the group of people that are Jewish is such a problematic uh, uh, question. And it has been a huge political issue in Israel for its entire existence. And there is questions of uh, defining it based on self-identification, based on uh, ethnicity, based on religion, and so on and so forth. Uh, so even if we know a kind of a name for the group, there, may, there can be many, many ways of defining the group. And uh, we want perhaps to simultaneously protect against all of these groups. Uh, at once, and all of these different ways of defining these groups at once. And in fact, what we can actually uh, see is that it's important to protect not only groups that are in general uh, kind of need, need protections, but subgroups that, that are important for a particular task. So uh, one of the examples we gave a while ago is that of uh, uh, an advertiser for a burger joint and uh, that wants to discriminate against members of some subpopulation. And to do that, they can advertise uh, to the vegans in the subpopulation and to carnivores in the general population. So while advertising to many, many people in a, in a subgroup, they are still excluding it. So in this particular example, the carnivores of a particular population are the subgroup we want to protect. But of course, nobody would define carnivores of, of any subgroup uh, as, as a, a protected group. So each um, task, each algorithmic task brings uh, with it a variety of new groups that need protections. So what we are trying to say is that we shouldn't uh, try to identify ahead of time which groups need protections, but we should try to protect all the groups that we can uh, simultaneously. So it sounds like a very ambitious uh, goal. Somehow you're saying that you uh, are gonna have some abstract a uh, notion of uh, protecting uh, all groups, uh, all subgroups. Uh, so uh, can, is there a mathematical definition for it? Well, that's one question. And second of all, can you achieve it? Right, so, so certainly we cannot protect all groups. Uh, and here is where uh, the theory background comes into play. What we can do or can, can try to do is protect every group that we can identify. So if uh, there is a group and the task of looking at the, an individual, Shafi, and saying, is Shafi part of this group or not? If this is something that we can do computationally, then we have a hope of uh, protecting this subgroup. And, uh, and so that our notions come, or the notion of groups we want to protect come from uh, computational abilities. We're trying to protect all the groups that we can identify using our computational resources. It's still extremely ambitious, uh, but uh, it turns out that, that in many, many cases we can. Uh, we can uh, deal 
with uh, all the groups in very, very rich collections, as long as some learning uh, capabilities are possible for these groups. And perhaps I shouldn't get uh, more technical than that, uh, but um, as long as we can, as these groups that we want to protect are not too complicated computationally, then we can protect them. This certainly captures a lot of the groups we care about. So groups like uh, intersection of some uh, protected attributes, but also things that are more sophisticated than that. So in fact, uh, multi-calibration has been implemented and has been uh, used in the real world. And there are uh, various packages like uh, our package in, uh, uh, and other packages. So it is doable. And it, yeah, I also uh, find it pretty surprising that we can uh, do so much of that. So you're using uh, algorithms in two ways. One way is to using an algorithm to identify whether I am a member of a group or not, because you were talking about computational ability. And secondly, once that's being determined, you also have an algorithm for, let's say, determining whether somebody should get a job, see a, an ad for a job, be accepted to school, uh, via another algorithm. So you're using algorithms here in two possible, in two different ways. Yeah, at least. So uh, essentially, right, there is this uh, uh, principle in ethics that uh, uh, ought implies can. We cannot ask for uh, to do something that's impossible. It cannot be a, a moral imperative to do something that you cannot do. And in a sense, we're bringing the computational perspective and saying what you can or cannot do depends on your computational resources, as well as some uh, um, uh, information that you have. But I think the understanding that information is important for fairness and the quality of data is important for fairness uh, was uh, understood. And what we are trying to add is that the computation and the computational power is very, very important for fairness. So what are the resources of the people that design the algorithms? What are the uh, resources of the people that try to audit these algorithms? And of course, we haven't uh, even discussed the complexity of what would discriminate, what kind of discrimination uh, would mean. And here we also perhaps want to look at the computational power uh, of the um, algorithms that are trying to discriminate and we want to protect against. So you mentioned that you have packages, uh, both a, I assume at Stanford or in other places, uh, and my question now is, uh, what are some areas of application where you've seen uh, multi-group uh, fairness notions and maybe and code, or maybe these packages applied? Right, so uh, I think that the, the first place in which uh, and this has been uh, applied and, uh, and actually first in uh, experimental uh, studies, but then later uh, in real life applications was the medical arena. And I think the medical arena is really very primed to the specific. So I've been talking very generally about multi-group fairness, but uh, for the, sp the specific notion that uh, we have introduced is multi-calibration. And that looks uh, at kind of accuracy as sometimes as an aspect of fairness. So being inaccurate on a particular group uh, could be a sign of discrimination. So in the, in the example we mentioned that you predict the probability of a medical condition, uh, if you're inaccurate, if you're predicting too high a probability or too low a probability, in both cases, you're harming an individual. So what you really, really want to be for every individual is accurate. And what you um, uh, want to make sure is that there is no group that we are harming. So actually uh, in very similar con cases, they've shown that the, um, the kind of predictors that are used day to day when you go to the to to the office of your physician and they apply this algorithm for you, are perhaps accurate in general, but very inaccurate on subpopulations. 
and multi-group fairness, multi-calibration can be used to make them much better on many, many subpopulations. And then COVID came and which gave an example for an amazing application that I wouldn't have imagined. And this was about two years since we introduced multi-calibration. And that was used um, by Klalit uh, Healthcare, uh, which is the biggest healthcare provider in Israel, one of the biggest in the world, to create a predictor for COVID complications. The amazing thing was that at the time they didn't have real data. And they didn't have real data from, um, uh, from Israel, they had some very uh, kind of uh, coarse uh, statistics from China. And they used our methods to get something much better, but perhaps in a higher level, um, whenever you want to deal with a population that is uh, very heterogeneous, uh, where um, you cannot look at individuals all the same, but it's very important the collection of attributes that they have, uh, then multi-group fairness makes sense. So that was one arena and there are other arenas like uh, in general statistics and perhaps we'll talk about it a bit uh, later. Uh, so yeah, we didn't create all of these packages. It's amazing uh, being a theoretician. This didn't come from me, but uh, this happened in many, uh, by many others. Uh, so, um, I've been quite amazed by how quickly, right? Uh, you definitely know how, how the length of time that it takes uh, for theory work to get into practice. And, and here it was much, much quicker. So you mentioned the medical field uh, and um, in, in the medical field and, and, and other examples you've given, you're always talking about predictions. So you're trying to predict yes or no, um, should get a medication, shouldn't get a medication, is high risk for COVID, isn't high risk for COVID complications, should go uh, on bail, not on bail. Um, I was, uh, it reminds me of an example that um, I heard from someone else, my son, <laughs> about self-driving cars. And uh, he was saying, suppose you have a self-driving car and, and the car um, is going to make a decision, it notices that uh, women drivers are more hesitant uh, to, cu uh, to cut. So you may learn that it's worth it if the driver in the other car is a woman is to cut in front of them because then you will probably not be at risk uh, of an accident. And uh, it makes sense. It's gonna get you to work on an individual level earlier, but 10 years down the line, well, there's prediction there, but 10 years down the line, uh, all women are gonna be coming to work you know, an hour later because people have, have been cutting them. So there's also this question of whether something is fair or not um, in a way that affects the future. So it's still a question of prediction, I guess, of whether this person is likely to object if you're gonna cut in front of them, but uh, the harm in that is, is something that only will be determined later. Yeah, does that come into the research at all? Absolutely, I think that you've kind of hinted on, on several uh, different areas of research that uh, actually did come into play in, in the last workshop. I just say that your story is not really, perhaps it's, uh, it's still a story for self-driving cars, but it's not a story for our society in general. Uh, but uh, because this is how discrimination works, right? And, and how it propagates uh, over time. Uh, but with respect to algorithms, uh, there are several questions here. Um, in particular, so when you're doing predictions, the question is, uh, are you doing uh, predictions that are right at the moment? Or you're trying to uh, make decisions that would have a positive impact in the future? And uh, this kind of downstream effect plays a huge uh, importance in, in many uh, studies. And uh, as one of the talks uh, uh, in this workshop talked about is kind of uh, uh, talked about a better future, kind of decisions for a better future. 
Uh, so uh, while we can still talk about affirmative action and the Supreme Court didn't uh, uh, rule against it, uh, many of the things we do, uh, like trying to understand reality at the moment in the most accurate way, could be used or should be viewed as a step towards correcting and improving and um, improving uh, uh, the world. So uh, accuracy doesn't uh, mean necessarily that you're going to use it to uh, propagate reality. You can use it to for affirmative action, for social engineering. That's one thing. Another thing is that beyond the predictions, there are uh, interventions. So perhaps your decision is not if to accept somebody to university or not, but rather when you accept them to the university, what kind of um, intervention can be used to increase their probability of success. And so interventions is a huge uh, uh, area of study. Uh, causality, uh, so many of the things we've discussed, uh, like multiple fairness as impacting causality, so not just uh, um, what's the prediction now, but if I do a particular action, what would happen then? So what's the treatment effect? Uh, so absolutely right that we, uh, if we just propagate reality, it can become uh, worse and worse. Yeah, um, I was thinking that when you were talking about a lot of things, for example, in cryptography, it's taken 30 years or so to actually be used. But I think that you're right, that <clears throat> COVID-19 was sort of like a, we were thrown into a huge experiment and um, a multidisciplinary experiment, you know, doctors, computer scientists, epidemiologists, you know, a, a government regulators, and we had to sort of act. So there, so put everything into a much more rapid uh, deployment. Um, you mentioned statistics. So um, uh, I hear more and more that collecting statistics, even via human surveys, getting someone to fill a survey, uh, certainly human experimentation in the field of medicine, uh, even animal, uh, animal experiments in labs, uh, in Berkeley campus and other campuses, is uh, it's notoriously expensive. And in fact, if you look at a lot of articles that come up, let's say in Science Magazine, very you know, respectable venues, uh, and you look at the numbers that they're quoting, they're very small. Sometimes you can have an experiment with 20, 20 sp specimens. Uh, certainly a, a, something like 100 is considered a, a huge achievement of, in terms of the number of samples that you have. The, on the other hand, when we talk about data science and computer science, we huge. We use numbers, you know, when we talk about large data, we are talking about hundreds and thousands, uh, not to say the least. So um, I understand that, that there might be some way that your work on multi-group fairness in some strange segue uh, could help us maybe reuse statistics or use uh, statistics that was used in one domain in another one, or perhaps uh, uh, be happy with the fact that we have smaller rather than larger samples. How's that? Yeah, so so that was a huge surprise uh, for me, and and this was this example that I will discuss, but also other examples where we cared about discrimination. Uh, we definitely didn't try to find new ways uh, of doing things in machine learning or new ways in statistics, but somehow uh, there was there was something uh, here in this notion of multicultural fairness, multicalibration, that seems to bring uh, kind of lots of uh, impact and new paradigms in in other domains. So specifically for the statistics case. Uh, yeah, we've been hearing from our collaborators in the statistic arena that getting uh, data that is, I mean, there is some cheap data, like the ones that you can do by uh, setting up a survey on your web page. Um, but this kind of data is, is also not necessarily representative. It's not the distribution you want to, uh, to uh, understand, but rather the people that uh, visit your web page and are willing to fill up these surveys. 
and there are, and other no, other data is much much more expensive. Um, similarly, if you run a medical experiment, uh, a, a medical study in Stanford University, you don't want to have to do the same experiment, uh, same study in every other uh, hospital. But if you use this in some other hospital then you will have a different distribution over individuals. So this question of how to translate uh, findings, statistical findings, learning findings from one distribution to the other uh, is extremely motivated and, and highly studied. And in a very strange uh, twist, this notion of multi-calibration uh, uh, seemed to give us something extremely robust to this kind of distributional shifts. And the intuition is that if in our study in, pre, in Stanford, we don't only care about the general population, but we care about a lot of subpopulations, then this study will be very, very robust to shifts uh, because even if, if in a different hospital, the mix of population is different, because our uh, findings were good for each subpopulation, they will translate uh, well. Uh, so this gave us uh, uh, this notion of universal adaptability, which says that without even knowing where I want to transfer my findings, I can in one study, uh, um, uh, in one place translate it to many, many other studies, uh, in, to other domains, to other uh, places. And um, so that was one case in which this notion that was about discrimination translated to something very powerful, in a sense, a new paradigm uh, in a different area of statistical uh, validity. So I realized that throughout the questions, uh, sometimes you use the, you use the notion multi-calibration and sometimes multi-group fairness. Uh, just for the more uh, astute uh, listener, can you uh, elaborate on the difference or similarity of these two notions? All right, so multi-group fairness is about uh, this idea that you want to provide whatever notion of uh, protection against discrimination, you want it not for a few groups, but you want it for a very rich collection of groups. Multi-calibration, which was the specific notion that we introduced uh, in, uh, in my group, uh, was um, is, is about what is the specific thing you ask for each population. And the specific thing is this notion of calibration, which essentially means that what you say uh, corresponds to reality. So if you say for, for particular individuals that uh, one fourth of them will, uh, will see a particular outcome, one fourth of them uh, will repay a loan, then indeed one fourth of them will. So uh, it just means that the, um, the meaning of what you say is the same in all subpopulations that you consider. This one has been very uh, useful. It gave us this notion of universal adaptability. It also gave us other notions like omniprediction, uh, which again is kind of trying to, to revisit a very, very um, kind of common uh, paradigm in learning, which is loss minimization. And it gives us a very, very powerful way to simultaneously minimize loss in many, many different ways uh, without uh, necessarily even knowing ahead of time what is the relevant loss we care about. Um, it gave us this notion of uh, outcome indistinguishability that uh, gives a new uh, understanding of some uh, notions in complexity theory, which is completely uh, uh, different or in a sense, gives us a new understanding of what is the meaning of individual probabilities. So, yeah, so multi-calibration is a particular form of uh, multi-group fairness, uh, which is uh, um, and one of those that were used to introduce this notion. There were other notions introduced by a group of scientists in um, Penn University uh, simultaneously. Uh, but yeah, multi-calibration is this specific one. 
So to rephrase uh, what you said, uh, so somewhat informally, so multi-group fairness requires uh, some notion of fairness that would hold across these different groups defined in the way that you would describe. And multi-calibration is a specific uh, notion of, uh, of fairness, perhaps. Yeah. Is that the, whatever the, the prediction that you make should actually be to, ma to match what happens uh, in reality. Yeah. 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 Um, so the next question is really because you cannot have any interview or conversation or dinner uh, um, during May 2023, this is for future generations who are going to watch this polylog without mentioning ChatGPT. So that's all the rave, whether it's ChatGPT or ChatGPT 3 or 3.5 or 4. I think that one of the things that's happened is that even people who have been asleep and have a notion, notice that algorithms are important and algorithmic fairness um, is uh, being discussed, are now talking about uh, machine learning. Machine learning algorithms, in specifically, I think they're thinking about these uh, generative uh, language models where you can make these prompts and get these incredibly intelligent sounding responses and every day we get uh, something new. So um, can you maybe uh, elaborate on some fairness related issues that are particular to ChatGPT? Absolutely, I mean- Large languages models altogether. I don't wanna yes. uh, single out OpenAI, but it could be DeepMind, maybe it could be Facebook, could be uh, other groups coming up, yeah. I think they, they won't mind being, uh, uh, Associated <laughs> solely associated with this notion of uh, I'm really talking about the fairness issues, so they yes. might find that. So, right. are, are there some things where there are fairness related that we should pay attention to, especially today, really May 2023, when a lot of AI people came out against the release of open AI, are calling for a pause, are calling for regulation. Does fairness play into this discussion? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, this entire area uh, of ours, and, and of course, uh, we come from a theory perspective, but we should say that it is a highly multidisciplinary area that invo involves philosophers and, uh, and legal experts. And within CS, it involves machine learning and HCI and other notions. But I think all of us uh, in this growing uh, um, uh, community or, or communities of researchers, I think feel like this uh, and child that tries to, to stop the flood by sticking the hand in, uh, in the dam before uh, everything collapses. But yes, why, so why, why stop the flood? You know, not everybody shares right. the same sentiment, by the way, and there are people on this call. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm... I'm <laughs> they not share your perspective. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. not. Uh, okay, so that's... Yeah, okay, so there is, uh, uh, so the flood that I want to stop is the flood of uh, discrimination. Uh -huh. And um, and I'm, I'm not even asking about the question of whether we should stop um, the progress, because I think it's not a question. I don't think that it can uh, be stopped. Uh, so, so the thing we are racing against is uh, huge developments and for us in our area where, I mean, our challenge is even understanding how to formalize, how to understand, how to discuss all of these notions. Um, and ChatGPT is, is really uh, an example where there could be many additional uh, concerns. So there could be concerns of the form that already bothered us before, which is what is the quality of the service, quote unquote, that these language models give different populations, uh, right? When we looked at, uh, at language understanding, I remember when uh, um, no machine could understand my uh, my accent because uh, I'm not uh, I'm not American, and uh, and that has improved. Similarly, what uh, the quality that we get. 
uh, from ChatGPT depends on which uh, sources of data they, they are using. This is one source of discrimination. The other source of discrimination, which is perhaps more new, is the fact that these models are behaving like human beings. They are closer to, closer to um, beating the Turing uh, challenge. And, uh, and now um, there is a question of uh, how do they use language? Um, so uh, discrimination of the form that we look uh, kind of at between uh, individuals. And um, are what they're saying uh, offensive in this way or another? Is it more offensive towards one population or another? It, is it um, uh, uh, using stereotypes on one population and then perhaps preserving these stereotypes? And uh, so a lot of the discussions that we didn't have before when we were just uh, worried about whether we are going to get the loan or not, and uh, now we, I mean, it's getting the loan or not, but uh, what kind of information they will let uh, uh, tell us in addition, how do, would they re refuse us uh, or not? So I think that ChatGPT, I mean, we are behind on other uh, technology in terms of formalizing everything and giving new, uh, uh, new models, new notions. ChatGPT is completely open, I think. And I don't think that the people that develop it uh, understand it well and understand the concerns well. And, uh, and uh, I don't think the community is understanding. And we will keep on uh, running behind this train and trying to do the best uh, that we can. So that's kind of the flood uh, metaphor. The flood is, is not that, uh, I mean, I think actually it is, I mean, it's definitely a good question of do we want to slow down or not? But that's not the question I I am trying to answer in my research. In my research, I try to say, okay, what can we say now? What can we do now uh, with uh, with the technology that's that's uh, uh, so fast? So, in terms of as related to fairness, it seems to me uh, people talk about maybe that this is democratizing access to technology. Uh, which sounds, you know, using at least the word fairness in its colloquial sense, that um, there's something beautiful here is that everybody has access to this. Um, so there's something fascinating about the fact that this human experiment is available to all. What do you think about that? Yeah, for, for sure. I think that in general, in technology, right, there is a huge uh, kind of potential to combat a lot of uh, discrimination. So many times when we look at technology and we say it is discriminating in one way or another, we are comparing it to an ideal that never existed uh, before. Um, and um, so, so I'm not there, but I'm also not in the, in the camp that says it's all good. So I think that it has good potential and uh, we cannot, um, ignore that, uh, but it also has the potential of harm. And, uh, and I guess another thing that comes to mind, in my mind, is related to fairness in ChatGPT, is that it's providing a laboratory for people like you and me uh, to kind of see uh, that this uh, system, which was designed in, in according to principles that nobody really truly comprehends their power, uh, enables us to um, observe lack of fairness or uh, and run experiments. I am told I, I, uh, that even the way you phrase a question to ChatGPT, if you ask, please, can you tell me some information or you demand to see some information, you will get different information, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, uh, I don't know. What do you think about that? Uh, right, and, and that's the, I mean, that's also the concern that uh, if you ask information in the way that ChatGPT understand better, uh, or they will, they will give it the information that, that you expect. And if you ask it in a different way, 
perhaps they will, uh, for example, interpret you as being aggressive when you're not, when this is just uh, the way you speak, the way people mm -hmm. like you speak. Um, I think it's fascinating. I think that, I think that there has been, so I do take your point that there has been uh, also demonization of uh, technology and idealization of humans uh, in parallel. And I don't feel that they are so different or there are, I think, very, uh, very few places in which algorithms are more dangerous than humans. Uh, I can say the one that, I mean, that are more uh, dangerous also in the long term. In the short term, there are lots of dangers. But in the long term, I don't think that people are, are better in, in many inherent ways. The only thing that in which algorithms are so much more dangerous is in scale. It could be that the same algorithm um, and, and some researchers in our community are looking exactly at that. that what happens when the same algorithm makes decisions in many, many, uh, across an entire uh, industry? So the same algorithm will filter your CV for all the jobs or will decide your loans in all the banks. So if before you went to a particular bank and a particular uh, racist potentially or sexist or any other uh, East, uh, individual uh, discriminate against you, perhaps in a different bank you have a better uh, uh, option. And that's one danger, an important danger in algorithms that it could be the same. You're meeting the same uh, algorithm again and again. But yeah, I think that there is huge potentials also for, uh, I mean, our, our society is not without faults. So I think algorithms here too have a huge potential of, of doing good, but uh, it requires a lot of people in many uh, different communities to work on it. Can you tell me maybe what were the big surprises in the workshop? Uh, I know you were the organizer, so maybe there are no surprises because you organized it, but still, is there some highlights that you can mention or highlight? I think for me, the, the huge surprise was how uh, spread these notions are. It's, we're talking about research from about five, six years ago. And when I was starting to think uh, uh, with other co-organizers about having this workshop, uh, I thought about it as first as a way to kind of spread the word and then perhaps to have better understanding of, of what small collections of individuals are already doing. But uh, going to the workshop and people that kind of contacted us and said, oh, I want to come and I do this, I, I have this work that is related. I realized that these notions that come from fairness are already much more uh, well understood than I, than I thought they are and spread in communities that I wasn't aware of, that they are uh, no, knowing that so in, in particular in machine learning and statistics, more people are working on it and, and, and using it than, than I realized. So that's kind of on the level of uh, how spread. So this, this for me was a surprise, how well spread this notion is. Um, the, in addition, the results were just uh, beautiful. I mean, there's tons of great work done and the connections to complexity theory, are very beautiful and some of them are new to me. Um, kind of all mathematical results that uh, are somehow improved now using uh, techniques that come from a completely different domain. So like any kind of good research, uh, it always has applications beyond uh, what it was intended for. Absolutely. Um... Let me ask you another question, which I didn't see work in the conference on and occurs to me. So you develop methods for multi-calibration, for multi-group fairness, for other things uh, that are related to uh, essentially advising companies who are designing algorithms or, or advising individual entities who are 
devising algorithms how to do it better. So it will have better societal value, societal impact. How do you know that they're doing it? How do you verify? Right. Well, that's a great question. Uh, of course, you're a much better person to answer it. Uh, but um, I don't know to answer it, but I can certainly ask it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it's not only to design algorithms, but it also perhaps to audit for algorithms and uh, to regulate algorithms. And then when we're talking about regulations, then uh, verifying is important uh, idea. And here we do have the tension between companies doing something that's proprietary. They don't want to give you the insight of what they do. And, um, and now can you prove it in some zero knowledge way or some cryptographic methods? And I think that there is a lot of uh, research to do on that. Uh, you have uh, been starting to work, I mean, in this specific direction of uh, fairness, but definitely for other uh, notions. And um, there was one work, uh, Gray Borthbloom gave a talk about uh, helping to verify properties of uh, distributions. But uh, it seems to me that algorithm fairness in general have intersection with essentially any other area that I can think of. And uh, we've seen intersections with game theory, methods that come from game theory and that help uh, uh, get uh, multi-calibration, intersection with complexity theory, intersection with cryptography exactly around that. And of course, uh, machine learning and statistics. And uh, so I think that what this workshop can do, if, if any, is encourage people that have been hearing about this uh, fairness thing for a while and uh, say, okay, perhaps we are too late and say, no, there are foundational aspects uh, of uh, algorithmic fairness that are we just starting to understand. And whatever area you come from, it's very, very likely that what you're bringing to the table could, uh, could be useful. My analogy, and you can tell me uh, much better. Uh, I mean, when I studied cryptography and I worked in cryptography, I was saying, oh, but if I was active just uh, earlier, like in the eighties, uh, I could have done uh, this uh, amazing fundamental uh, work, foundational work. And my feeling is that algorithmic fairness is a little bit like cryptography in the eighties. That's my analogy. No, absolutely. Um, I, this issue that I asked about verifying, uh, it's not just because it's my own, uh, in some sense, I've done it before, this, these methods for verification where verifying is um, separate from the act of doing. So say you are someone who designed an algorithm, you think maybe you do, you've done your best, maybe you, have, you, you were trying to pretend you've done your best. This issue of verification, I think, is very important in the field where it's going to, we're going to assume that this is deployed and then we might relax. And we, I don't think we should relax because, um, you know, there might be incentives not to be fair because it might be cheaper for you. It might require less effort. Maybe you want to discriminate. Um, and I think the question of verifying is, is, is key. Um, I think you agree with me in any case. I, no, I do agree with you. And <laughs> in general, I think that uh, there should be very little relaxing in this area. But right. what we understood very early on is that there is no, not going to be one notion of fairness. And this means that everything you do towards one and a notion of fairness may harm you in a different aspect. So you should always be debating what is the discrimination you want to protect against. And then uh, you should uh, ask, are you protecting against? And this is where verification, cryptography could play a huge, uh, a huge role. Um, so this is almost the last question. So I know this has been a long interview. Uh, I think in 2018, there was a cluster on algorithmic fairness uh, at Simon's Institute, you were there. There was also a workshop at the time uh, that uh, had a lot of scholars from other fields, not just uh, computer scientists, not just theoretical computer scientists, people from law, from public policy, 
and they uh, at that time showed um, great uh, concern uh, as to who are we as algorithms people uh, uh, in the sense how do we know that we are going to uh, make a positive impact rather than sort of shake everything up if algorithms re replace laws um, so I recall that I, I think that the field and the attitude to the field has changed quite a bit. And um, I was wondering what you think about it and whether um, there's any legal frameworks that have been developed since about actually applying um, you know, algorithms, statistical predictive models to individuals. Yeah, I, um, there's lots in what you asked. Uh, one, as I said at first, these, these clusters were very important because I mean, uh, individuals try to look at the particular area and say, oh, you know, it's important. I want to do something good in it. But uh, we know that uh, progress is done by a community, real progress. It's very hard in our field to make uh, big progress in areas that are new, like algorithmic fairness, just by yourself. And so the two summers that we had at the Simon Institute, we're kind of like these small laboratories of uh, can we work together? What do we care about? What do other communities uh, care about? And they were uh, very instrumental. And they seem to also encourage us to do this uh, um, Simons collaboration. So another arm of the Simons Foundation and that we're part of the, this uh, Simons collaboration on the foundation of algorithm fairness, which again, beyond all the beautiful results, it's a lot about community building. And I have the feeling that uh, with these two efforts and others, we're getting closer and closer to a very, very vibrant community that can really do major changes. Specifically, you were talking about this uh, uh, wrong at the root. I always yes, the, name, the name of the workshop was wrong at the root. Right? Yeah, uh, which was, uh, really an amazing workshop. It brought uh, uh, um, people from really uh, very different communities, uh, philosophy, sociology, law. And it was uh, not an easy uh, workshop to be part of, right? Because different communities have really, beyond different language, different values. So for example, we encountered uh, people that from their perspective, very justifiably, they have huge mis mistrust in science, in, uh, in math, and definitely in algorithms. And it was a very important discussion to start having. Um, and I don't think we are resolving every, everything or perhaps that we resolved anything. Uh, because I feel that all of these communities have a role to play. Uh, but I think that uh, it helped the different communities do their job better, in particular, the theory community uh, enters this with a bit of a better understanding of what bothers other, other communities. So I think this was uh, really a very provocative and eye-opening and important uh, event. And in terms of legal uh, frameworks, uh, are they emerging? Uh, yeah, so the legal uh, world um, is much more conservative uh, than uh, computer science and theory. And so things we understand, and it's not only in uh, fairness, in privacy, for example, um, some of the regulations and laws that are in privacy they are highly, highly outdated. Um, and I think it's going to be uh, still a huge effort. This effort happening more and more. So there are uh, more and more discussions between, uh, definitely between scientists in different areas with and, and joint courses that you were part of one. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion and I think there, is, there are beginnings, but there's still huge differences. So the first paper that we mentioned a few times, we called it uh, Fairness Through Awareness. 
And one of the insights was that you should be aware of uh, um, cultural differences. You should be aware of the, um, the sensitive attributes to provide fairness. And this is still something that's very controversial in the legal arena. Many times you're not even allowed to see a sensitive attribute. And so there are huge differences, both in uh, what we find and, uh, for example, this uh, question of uh, access to sensitive attributes, there's huge difference in values and there are huge uh, differences in, in the character, uh, like uh, how quickly the area uh, progresses. So if theoreticians are chasing the the high-tech uh, progress, I think uh, the legal experts are still chasing even us. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, but it's a huge area now with lots of great people working on it. So I'm, I am optimistic of the progress. And I think that there are good reasons why uh, the legal world should be a little bit more conservative. <laughs> So instead of chasing, I would have used the word lagging behind. Uh, so if we crawl behind practice, you know, they're crawling behind us. Uh, you know, I, you're, I completely agree with you that, um, you know, that example that you gave about not being aware as a require, legal requirement versus saying that we actually need all these attributes in order to do our algorithms properly is a great example. It reminds me of another example many years ago, I guess at this point, maybe it was 2000, uh, 18, there was a workshop that Cynthia Dwork ran at Harvard and about fairness, but it was really not talking about definitions, just bringing people from all walks of the university uh, to talk about it. And um, a, it was brought up that suppose there are two candidates to, for acceptance to school, they have exactly the same, the same uh, record. How do you are decide, and, but you have only one slot, how do you decide between them? And one of the computer scientists said, well, you toss a coin. And if it's heads, you let the, somebody, one person tells the other. And uh, several of the social scientists were kind of outraged. They said, that's not fair. They used the word fair, that it would it'd be up to the outcome of the coin toss, where us as mathematicians, there isn't anything more fair than that because we don't control it. But right. it just sort of highlighted how differently we think about it. Yeah, and this is, yeah, the, the question of, uh after the fact and, and before kind of fairness. Uh, there are other um, points uh, where that I think are kind of more about values that I think are important. One is that um, um, there is this question of how define you want to, be, to have things. And in a sense, uh, obfuscation is, is almost a value in the legal system. Uh, we've seen it uh, in, um, uh, for example, in the Supreme Court decisions on uh, all decisions about affirmative action. The thing that passed the Supreme Court were the more obfuscated affirmative action rather than the transparent one. Um, it could be subject to interpretation, you're saying, because so they allow us. Right. And in addition, there is a view of, um, so here is, I think, I think everything that we said before, I think I completely understand. I think one place where I think perhaps some of the legal experts uh, are, are not having it completely right is that they have views of differences between humans and algorithms. In my eyes, are um, not as strong as they as they would would put them, where they view algorithms making decisions based on the past, based on patterns, and and, and would not put humans in the same category. And in the law, right, you are not supposed to. Um, punish people from for people for something that they may do, or uh, and so on. And I do believe that this is all very uh, serious concern at the moment. But I don't think that uh, it's such a true 
uh, separation between algorithms and humans. I think that often uh, humans are the product of all their past experiences and the patterns that they've been observing and they are making decisions based on the past rather than uh, and so I think that there is a lot more for us as communities to discuss and to understand. Uh, it's a huge challenge because we want our, um, our things to be relevant in the real world. And, and so I think that we as a community, perhaps instead of looking at the lagging behind, I think we are between two uh, different uh, communities that are pulling us in different directions between the high tech industry and some of the machine learning researchers that say, we can do all these amazing things, let machine learning be machine learning and that's the best outcome that's possible. And between other communities, perhaps on the legal arena and others it tells us, uh, I mean, stop <laughs> completely. And, uh, and uh, this is all wrong. Uh, algorithms are uh, discriminatory by definition compared to humans, in a sense, perhaps I'm exaggerating, but I do feel that our communities are kind of between these and I hope that we are striking a better balance than both. Yeah, and I would say that us theorists uh, are yet another community where we are willing to uh, we, de we sort of demand that things will be well-defined and that we can prove them. And at the same time, once they are well-defined and we can prove them, we think that's good enough. So there's plus and minuses of that. Uh, fascinating discussion. And I, 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 you know, I have a lot of other questions I want to ask you, but I think that I should let you go. And I want to really be, uh, um, express my gratitude for you, uh, this interview for organizing the workshop and for all the work you've done on algorithmic fairness and that you will do on algorithmic fairness and many other things. Thank you, Omar. Thank you so much.